winter draws on or begins uh, this this year, uh, uh, I'm just uh, I know Don and Jill are going to be leaving in a in a month or so, month and a half, uh, and so uh, we may want to revisit the idea of a midweek service if, uh, if people you know are not interested really in, in getting together. We may want to get together at somebody's house during the week or something, um, but. Uh, uh, it seems like every winter we kind of drop off and it's hard to get people out in the cold. Uh, so pray, pray that we do that. I, I don't, uh, don't want midweek service to be a, a chore. It needs to be a, a blessing and an enjoyment uh, if we're going to do it. And uh, so just be praying for that. Um, <clears throat> all right. So what we're going to do tonight, though, guys, is, uh, you know, Sunday, Sunday we're going to conclude the uh, series on Matthew, and uh, we started that two years ago, and I'm pretty excited about it because we get to we get to talk about the Great Commission. Uh, but what I wanted to do is go back, uh, sort of to to the genealogy tonight of Matthew, and revisit where we started a couple of years ago. And uh, so, with that in mind, I've actually got the bulletin from a few years ago. If anybody wants to to follow along, and you know, I think you want to pass it back if anybody wants one of those. <laughs> And uh, so, <clears throat> so what you, have to, what, you, what you have to understand about Matthew's gospel, uh, well, there's a, there's a lot to look at. So uh, before we get started, let's, let's go ahead and pray. Father in heaven, we pray now that as we open your holy word that you bless us. We uh, desire, oh God, to be your disciples, to be uh, just as Jesus calls us to be. And so, Lord, we thank you for the rich food of your word and how good it is. Um, we enjoy it throughout the day, uh, throughout the week, but how good it is to come together uh, to study your word together and to delight in your promises. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to be in awe tonight of what you've done. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so a couple of notes, as you, as you can see there in your... In your bulletin, uh, the this book this book was written uh, by Matthew. Obviously, should be obvious. It's not obvious to many uh, uh, so-called liberal scholars. But uh, but this book this book is well attested in ancient Christian literature. Um, it uh, it was written by Matthew probably in the 50s or early 60s of the first century. Uh, the earliest Christian literature uh, demonstrates that all Christians were well acquainted with Matthew's gospel. Uh, so, you know, you can find in the Epistle of Clement of Rome, which was written in 96 AD, uh, the, the, the Epistle of Clement was written to the Corinthian church, and, uh, and, and he mentions uh, Matthew's gospel, he quotes from it. Uh, the letters of Polycarp and Ignatius uh, quote from it in the, in the 100s. Uh, the Didache, which the Didache is... is, is I, I put it at I, 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 I put it at 110. Uh, some will say that it goes back all the way to, to around the year 80. Um, if you've never read the Didache, it's pretty interesting to read. Uh, it's got our first description of Christian baptism, by the way, uh, outside of the New Testament, and uh, it, it allows for all the modes that we practice as Presbyterians: uh, immersion, sprinkling, or pouring, uh, which is pretty interesting to have such an ancient uh, testament to the mode of baptism. But anyway, that's another story. Uh, fragments of Papias, and uh, who's a disciple of John, um, and, and interestingly, John's gospel quotes from Matthew. So by the time John gets to writing his gospel in the late uh, part of the first century, in the 80s or early 90s, um, the Christian communities were so familiar with Matthew's gospel that when John writes, he assumes that uh, Christians know Matthew, that Christians are well acquainted with the gospel of Matthew. Um, and you can see this in the way John writes. He, he will uh, summarize entire events, entire uh, series of events, like, like the ministry of John the Baptist, in just a few, uh, uh, a few verses, uh, as opposed to, uh, to the evangelists and especially to Matthew. And, uh, and he'll act, he actually quotes from Matthew's gospel in John 1.15. So, so this, is, uh, this is one of multiple reasons why, if you've ever wondered when the canon was arranged, why Matthew is placed first. Um, and it's uh, not only because of this, but also because of the genealogy we're going to look at today. Now, um, I always thought the genealogy was kind of boring um, growing up. 
I, I, would, I don't know if you've been there or not. I would, I would skip through the genealogy and start reading at verse 18. Uh, <clears throat> although there was this one time in school when uh, we were asked to, I went to a Christian school in elementary school, and uh, we were asked to each pick out a, a, a section of scripture and read when it was our turn. Um, and so each child in the morning would stand and, and would read. And when it was my turn, I thought, well, it makes sense to start at the beginning. And we were New Testament Christians. So I started with Matthew and read the genealogy. And so I was like in third grade, struggling to read the words, to read the names. And the, uh, the teacher, when I was done, uh, was very upset at me for choosing this passage of Scripture and told me it had absolutely no value, no relevance, uh, no import. And why would I choose a text like that? And she was absolutely wrong. And I didn't know why she was wrong. I felt really embarrassed. But <clears throat> she was absolutely wrong because the genealogy is hugely important. Uh, so let's read the genealogy and then we'll, we'll see why it's so important. So this is what it says. And this is how Matthew starts his gospel. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, and Ram the father of Amminadab, and Amminadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David the king. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah, and Solomon the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam the father of Abijah, and Abijah the father of Asaph, Asaph the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat the father of Joram, and Joram the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah the father of Jotham, and Jotham the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz the father of Hezekiah, Hezekiah the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh the father of Amos, and Amos the father of Josiah, Josiah the father of uh, Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. And after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel, and Shealtiel the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel the father of Abiah, and Abiah the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim the father of Azor, and Azor the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Achim, and Achim the father of Eliad, and Eliad the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar the father of Mathan, and Mathan the father of Jacob. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations. And from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. Okay, so, so what, what, what should uh, jump out at you at the beginning of beginning to read this genealogy? is the way that Matthew begins uh, to introduce the Christ. And he says in the beginning, he says that this is the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And so when he says, when he says the genealogy of Jesus Christ, uh, what, what does the word Christ mean? What does that mean? Anointed. Yeah. Yeah, the anointed one, the, the Messiah, yes, the, the, the one who whom they are looking for. Uh, the the uh, so he is so so Jesus is is identified right off the bat as the Christ. So he he doesn't beat around the bush, does he? He just jumps right to it and he says, "This is the one that I'm talking about, uh, Jesus the Christ." But then he says, "The son of David, the son of Abraham," and uh, and so when when he says the son of Abraham, that's a that's a theological term, and it should it should uh, it, it would. Uh, ring a bell in the in the mind of of the Jewish audience that Matthew's writing to, uh, and and where it would take them was back to the covenant promise that God made with Abraham at the very beginning. So let's let's go there. Let's turn back to Genesis twelve, verses one through three, and I'll be uh, I'll be talking about this uh, or preaching about this on on Sunday uh, in part, but. I won't have as much time to, to uh, sort of dwell on it as I, as I do now. So if you go back to, to Genesis 12, 1 through 3, and uh, uh, Walt will ask you, we read that, rather, that, that passage. And let me, let me say, before he does this, before he reads, 
What's just happened? What happens in Genesis 11? Anybody know? Genesis 1 through 11 cover thousands of years of history. But in Genesis 11, Adeline, you remember what happened? It's okay. The Tower of Babel. Yeah, and what happens at Babel? You get dispersed. Yeah, all the nations get dispersed. They go, they're dispersed because of why? Because of the Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel. But what's God do to disperse them? Language. Language. Scatter the languages. Scatter the languages. Yeah, he confuses their languages. So now they're, they're, they're speaking different languages. Good job, buddy. And, uh, and so he scatters the nations, and then so God comes to, in, in Genesis 12, well, go ahead, go ahead and read that, brother. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make you make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Okay, so did you catch that? What did God promise to Abraham? Or to Abram when he calls him? Yeah, buddy? That he would be a, a son of all... I, I the father of all the people that believe in God. Yeah. Yeah, he'd be a father of one nation or how many nations? <coughs> many nations, many nations yeah. And they have the stars. Wow, okay, yeah, his descendants would be like the, the stars of, of the sea. Now, uh, how many children did Abraham have? Do you remember? Or the stars of the sky, stars of the sea. There's not many stars. <laughs> and there's, you know, the starfish. So that's what I meant, you know. Yeah. Okay, so all right, thanks, stars of the sea. Uh, I was thinking about the sand of the sea, but uh, seashore. But so, so uh, how many sons did Abraham have? Who were Abraham's sons, Tim? You remember? Not, not, not as the stars of the sea. Yeah. So the, the, the two, yeah. So he had, he had, he had Ishmael and Isaac, right? And so, uh, and, and so when he's very old, he says, I don't have any offspring. And he's doubting God's promise, or he's at least calling it into, into question and so forth. But, um, but, but this promise to, to bless you and make you a great nation, and uh, in you all the, uh, all, all the nations of the earth will be blessed, uh, that's, that's what is in the background of uh, the beginning of, of Matthew's gospel. So, in other words... Through Abraham's life, so Ab Abraham was called out from the nations. What's wrong, honey? You okay? Um, so, so, so Ab Abraham was called out from one of these nations that scattered, and and God says to him, He chooses him and He calls him, and He says, "I'm going to bless you and make your name great." And so, by the time Abraham <laughs> dies, as we'll look at Sunday, uh, he has. Flocks and herds, and he's a great man, bless you. And he's very powerful. Y'all making me sad. Can we can we just uh, can we pause it? Just, or, well, I'll pause it. It's, I don't know what y'all are upset about, but it's going to be okay. Okay, it's going to be okay. Y'all are tired, but it's going to be all right. All right, I love y'all. Okay. All right, we've had a rough day. Um. So, but so, so anyway. So the point is, the point is that God makes makes Abram a great man, and He blesses him. And then throughout the Old Testament, God fulfills the second part of that promise, the national promise, which is to make him a great nation. And He does. And he blesses him. So Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they become a you know Jacob's sons, and then they go to uh, to, to Egypt, and they become a great nation. Um, and so, uh, so by the time, but but still, uh, this third part of the promise of all the nations of the earth will be blessed uh, is not fulfilled in the Old Testament. Now, there, there are times in the Old Testament when Gentiles come to believe the gospel and come into the kingdom of Israel or into the nation of Israel, and they join with the people of Israel. We we looked at this recently in family devotions. Do y'all remember? Ava, do you remember who, who uh, when they go into the promised land? 
you remember, do you remember what, what happens? There's a group of people and they, they show up with the, with the moldy bread. Do you remember that? Well, anyway, so, so God make, so, so the people will make, make covenants with, and, and they, they, they make them their servants, but they, uh, but they, they end up uh, receiving the blessing of being part of, uh, in community with the people of God. And then there's, there's people like Ruth and Rahab and, uh, you know, and others that, that join. You know, the Queen of Sheba is blessed. When she when she encounters Solomon's wisdom, uh, but but it's still very focused on the nation of Israel. It's very you know if you're going to be uh, a, a part of God's people, you have to come into the nation of Israel. You have to, if you're you know if you're male, you have to be circumcised, and then the the uh, the law in Leviticus uh, 16 it says that uh, that there's one law for the native born and for the foreigner. So, so the one who was born in the land, once they, uh, the one, the one who's born in the land is a Jew. The one who comes in and is circumcised and and uh, and, and uh, professes faith in the true God is also now part of the Jewish people. So you could you could be part of the blessing of Abraham by coming into the nation, but still this blessing of in you and in your offspring all the nations of the earth will be blessed. That didn't happen in the Old Testament. Um, and so when does that start to take place? With Christ and hmm? me? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. John Christ. When Christ came, and he made it very obvious if you read the gospel that he draws them in, the centurion and others. You know, it, it, it sort of starts when when the uh, Jews were scattered around and they began to put up synagogues all over the world, and people were exposed to the to the Jewish teaching. <coughs> And it became God fearers. Yes. And that, that was sort of pre, uh, b before Christ, but of course it came to fruition in, in, the, in the ministry of Jesus. But that was sort of part of it. Yeah, absolutely. And God even used, uh, you know, the uh, conquest of Alexander to, to, to unite, you know, the world with, or the known world in, in, in a common language. Mm -hmm. Uh, but but yeah, but, but particularly when when he says in the Great Commission, um, go into all the earth and preach the gospel to every nation, every creature. Right. And so 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 yes. Yeah, so, so you begin to see the the, the fulfillment of this Abrahamic blessing, um, and and it's right there hinted at in the genealogy uh, when Jesus is called the descendant of Abraham. He is the son of Abraham. Um, and so, um, so as you proceed through this, so Jesus is the son of David, the son of Abraham, and then it starts with Abraham, and then in verse six it goes to David, and that's a, as we've talked about before, that's a chiasm or a chiasm, if you'll call it that, where um, you know the the you know it's uh, David, Abraham, Abraham, David, but that's you know, we won't go there really, but but you can see that that. Uh, the blessing is particularly through Isaac, not Ishmael. You can see that in the in verse two. Abraham was the father of Isaac, so this covenant promise is going through Isaac, not Ishmael. Isaac was the father of Jacob, so you can see the covenant promise going through Jacob, not Esau. Um, and then, and then, so so these first two names are exclusive uh, lines through which the promise traveled, if you will, um, and they they exclude uh, Ishmael. They exclude Esau, and they're directing the line of, of Abraham that would inherit the promise uh, uh, through Abraham's descendants uh, uh, very clearly. And, uh, and so Isaac, Isaac is a child of promise, not Ishmael. Uh, Jacob inherits the blessing even though he's the youngest and even though he's frankly a scoundrel right? uh, at that point in his life. But it's because of God's Selection is because of God's election. But then notice in, it says, And Jacob, the father of Judah, and his brothers. And so now, now it's expanding it to, to the nation of Israel, or the foundation of the nation of Israel. And, and so we're seeing that the children of Jacob, the, the children of Israel, because uh, Jacob's name was Israel, the children of Israel together are part of uh, the, the group through which the promise will travel, as it were. Uh, and and this is uh, this is so uh, amazing, I think, because um, we're told that that uh, you know we're shown again and again that that the Israelites are the ones to whom the promises belong, 
until this promise is expanded to all nations, until the Gentiles are grafted into the spiritual Israel and so forth. Um, but, but even in Revelation, even in Revelation 12, if you, uh, if you want to look there with me real quick, you can see the, the what's the word? Unity of the scriptures, the unity of the mind of the spirit, no matter who's writing it. Uh, here is John uh, receiving a vision. But look at what he says. In Revelation 12. Um, and uh, Tim, you want to read Revelation? Oh, sure. Revelation 12, 1 through 6. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon under her feet, and on her head was a crown of twelve stars. And she was with child, and she cried out, being in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his head were seven diadems. And his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. And she gave birth to a son, a male child, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had placed a place prepared by God, so that there she might un, might be nourished for one thousand two hundred and sixty days. Okay, thank you. So, who's the dragon? Let's start. Let's start there. Who's the dragon? Satan. Satan. Okay. Uh, who's the child? Christ. The Christ. And how do we know that that, that it's Christ? Is uh, given to rule the nations with a rod of iron. Yes, yes, which is a fulfillment of a prophet, you know, of an old te of Old Testament prophecies uh, that use that same language of He will rule all nations with a rod of iron. Um, okay, and so uh, so who's the woman? Israel. Yeah, both are both are right. Israel. Adelon said the church. <laughs> both are right. Uh, because Israel, the true Israel, is the church. It is the congregation. The word, the word church, uh, ecclesia, is used uh, dozens of times to refer to Israel in the Old Testament. But yes, so, uh, so, so this is, now nobody said Mary, interestingly. Nobody said Mary is the woman. Why do we think that it's Israel and not Mary that's being seen here? There's a clue, a big clue. What she what she uh, what she have on her head? A crown of twelve stars. A crown of twelve stars. And what does that remind you of, Adelon? Joseph's dream. Joseph's dream. And what did the twelve stars represent in Joseph's dream? The twelve tribes of Israel. The twelve tribes of Israel. Absolutely. And so uh, so so the same thing that and this is scripture interpreting scripture. Very good. So uh, so so this is a wonderful. Uh, uh, way that we can see uh, a, and I, you know, I have not mastered Revelation. I'll just say that. I know, I know Tim has, Don has, Andy has, Walt has, everybody but me. But, you know, Revelation is amazing, but when we see, it's hard to interpret, but when we see such a clear one-to-one uh, -one parallel, uh, we can know conclusively what's being spoken of here, and, uh, and so th this is the theological truth that uh, that Israel gives rise to the Messiah, uh, just as was prophesied uh, again and again and again. So, so, so that's why back in the genealogy of Matthew, it it, it moves from these individuals, I, uh, uh, Isaac and Jacob, to the theological, uh, you know, or to the rather expansive uh, Judah and his brothers. Right. So they are all together. Uh, uh, those who will produce the, the Messiah in a way. And then it moves back, notice, to the individual line, Judah, Perez, Zerah, Tam, uh, Zerah by Tamar, 
and so forth. So does that make sense? So so and now I'll get to you. Yes. So does that make sense? So it's it's individual, individual, and then it's the nation of Israel, and then it traces the line back through the individuals. It's very perfect. <laughs> it's just perfect. Yeah, Walt. So uh, if woman is is Israel in this, uh, as it's interpreted as Israel, in verse 6 it says, the woman, who would be Israel, fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1260 days. Does that seem to indicate that um, Israel as a ethnic Israel is going into a wilderness or a hiding or some place prepared by God? For 1260 days, at which time after the 1260 days, there's going to be something different? I don't know. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> there's a, it's been a while since I've studied that uh, studied that part of the, the prophecy. Does anybody have a, an answer they want to want to bring up? There's there's several. I mean, um, you know, yeah, it, sound, it sounds like the flight of uh, Joseph and Mary to the desert, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. It sounds like their flight to Egypt. It could be Mary's representing Israel at that point. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mary, Mary is part of Israel. I mean, she was a she, she and Joseph are Jewish people, mm -hmm. and um, it could be that uh, it sort of shifts a little bit on that verse. So I don't know. I don't know. Yep, that crossed my mind. No, that's that's right. Yeah, and the uh, the dragon certainly you know is working through. Uh, you know, Herod to, to try to devour uh, the male child, try to kill him before he can begin his ministry. Okay, so uh, so yes, so <clears throat> moving on here to the to the rest of the genealogy. Uh, but yeah, Re Revelation. That's what that's one of the things that makes Revelation so difficult to interpret is because it's like this the symbols, the the, the apocalyptic symbols, uh, you know, blend and shift and um, you know can be can be difficult. So okay, um, all right, so. So you, so you can see, again, the theological perfection of going from individual to individual to the nation and then back tracing the line from then on out through the individuals that were direct uh, dis, uh, ancestors of, of Christ. Okay, the next thing that, that I want to look at is in verse 3, and this is where it gets really interesting. Um, I mean, it's all interesting, but this is where it gets redemptive, I guess you could say. Because look at the language that Matthew uses. Now, he, he, he says, And Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, by Tamar. Now, he didn't mean to say that. He didn't mean to bring up Tamar. Uh, there are many times when he just says, So-and-so, the father of so-and-so, right? And he just traces the line. But for some reason, he brings out Tamar. So who was Tamar? Yeah, she was a prostitute, but who else was she? What else? What else was she? She was born, wasn't she? No. No, she. But she was. Um, she was his daughter-in-law. So she. She was his own. Was she a foreigner? Go back and look. Go back and look. Uh, I know she. You know. I know she was. You know, she was his own daughter-in-law, and uh, you know, she was supposed. To, uh, she was supposed to, to have uh, his son, to, uh, another one. So, so her husband died, and uh, and without giving her a child, and and, and she was supposed to have, uh, be, and she was supposed to have been married to uh, to another one of his sons, but uh, but that didn't happen. And so she disguises herself as a prostitute. Um, she becomes, uh, she has his child, and. Uh, we won't we won't revisit all the de all the uh, details, but she she uh, proves that it's him, and he, he famously said he he's ready to he's ready to put her to death for her sin, which this is a really interesting dynamic because Judah has sinned with a prostitute, and then later he finds out his daughter-in-law is pregnant out of wedlock. He's ready to put her to death. And then she says, tell me if you can whose signet and whose staff this is. And it's his. And then he says, she has been more righteous than me. And that's when it really, that's when it's like, oh, uh, the blinders are taken off. And it's a real commentary on 
when we feel self-righteous, when someone is, is in sin and we want to be uh, less than merciful to them, it's a real commentary on maybe Judas should have turned his eyes inward for a minute and checked, it, checked himself and seen maybe where he was failing in his own pursuit of righteousness and holiness. But something happens, doesn't it? When, when time passes, we tend to rel relativize our own sin and our flesh tends to elevate ourselves above others. But what happens with Judah, bless you, what happens with Judah is his sin in the past is right back in his face. And that produces humility in him. Does that make sense? You know, when nobody knows about his sin, but hers is right there for everybody to see, it's easy for him to be all self-righteous and, you know, we've got to cleanse, we've got to cleanse uh, our family of this sin. But oh, when he comes out, then it's then now he wants to be merciful. So it's real, it's real interesting because, you know, uh, in the same manner that we judge, we will be judged, is what is what I'm saying. Um, so we, we should always be merciful and gracious. Doesn't mean that we lower the bar. It doesn't mean that we call, that we uh, wink at, at sin, whether it's our own or, or someone else's. But it does mean that we temper it with grace. Okay. All right. So so, but the point is here that this is not a <laughs> this is and this is something that Matthew will do. Uh, again and again throughout the genealogy, and we're going to look at several examples here. But one thing he's doing is disarming the self-righteous attitude of, of the religious leaders at the time who were going to read this. And, and he's pointing out the fact that, uh, you know, you don't, you know, you guys don't like the sinners and the prostitutes coming to hear Jesus, but your your boy Judah did this. You know. Judah, all you men who are of the tribe of Judah, through which came all the kings, look what he did. And you celebrate the fact that you're from Judah. He does the same with Solomon now. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. <laughs> and, and so this, these are very intentional inclusions in the genealogy. If Matthew had wanted to just rattle off a boring, you know, so-and-so begot so-and-so, he wouldn't have included these details. But, but when he does it, he's bringing up the, the embarrassing parts of Israelite history, isn't he? And so, so, he said, so Judah, uh, the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Amenadab. We're all fine here. Amenadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab. Uh-oh. Who was Rahab? Sounds like a to me. Yeah. Yeah, another another prostitute. And not just that, but she was a foreigner. She was a foreigner. She had no Israelite pedigree. Um, say sister. And and so so <laughs> What is she doing in the line of, of, of the kings? Because, see, before you get to Christ, you've got to get through David the king. And, you, and, and, before, and you've got to get to, to, to major figures in Israelite history. And, uh, and so all this Jewish pride is being really dismantled by this genealogy. And so she, so, so, and for us, you know, we, we can take this and, and show that God is always delighted in redeeming people. And in, in taking the, the most scandalous, the worst of the worst, and uh, in, in redeeming them, and not redeeming them at arm's length, and saying, "Yeah, you're forgiven, but you've got to, you know, you're not going to be in any use of the, you know, in the kingdom." He redeems them, and he elevates them uh, such that that Rahab is is a descendant of Christ. So Christ was not a. Uh, you know, he, he, you know. So Rahab, Rahab is, a, is an ancestor, rather, in the line of Christ. Now, of course, this is Joseph's uh, genealogy here, and Jesus is adopted. But the point is, uh, the point is still the same. And then, we, then we read very, the very next thing is, and Boaz, the father of Obed, by Ruth. And Ruth was a Moabitess. So you've got a Canaanite prostitute. You've got a Moabitess, and Mo, Moabites were unclean. Um, in the eyes of the Jews. Uh, 
Um, and so here's Gentile inclusion in the people of God right there in the genealogy. It's pretty awesome. <clears throat> so, so there's a lot of genealogical grace uh, in this. Okay, and then, then we move forward into the uh, uh, the the uh, choosing of David. Uh, David again is the youngest son, uh, like uh, you know, like uh, uh, Jacob, um, like Isaac, the youngest, the uh, the the uh, the one who is the least likely. Um, you know, we would expect that. Uh, Eliab, David's older brother, who was very celebrated by the Israelites, that he would be chosen. But instead, you know the story. It's look, look, that's where the famous uh, uh, phrase that uh, you know that, that uh, God says to Samuel: uh, "Man looks on the what outward, outward appearance, and God, but God sees the heart." Yeah. And uh, and so that's talking about you know don't look at his outward form, don't look at his height and his stature and his strength. Um, look look at the one as God looks. Look at David. And so David was, as we know, a man after God's own heart. He's he's chosen, and so we're we're good there. Jesse, the father of David the king. And so now the Israelites are, are who are reading this are probably thinking, okay, good, we're through that choppy part of our history. But then uh oh, David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. He doesn't even say Bathsheba. He says the wife of Uriah. So you can see what Matthew's doing here. Um, you know, we, we, we talk about the Messiah being the son of David. Uh, but, but my goodness, uh, look, look at what he's doing here. So, uh, so he's, he's, he's pointing out that even though she was a queen, even though Bathsheba was the queen, she was... Legitimately, the wife of Uriah, and so how did she become? How, how did uh, the wife of Uriah end up in the genealogy of Jesus? And and the answer is murder and adultery. So these are these are these these details are specifically and intentionally laid out there um, to to do several things. You know, to disarm again, to disarm the self righteousness of the Jews, but also to to, to point out that um, there's redemption and there's forgiveness and there's grace and there's healing and there's usefulness for people who we might be inclined to just cast off and dismiss. And that's not what Jesus did. You know, Jesus was called a friend of sinners. You know, he was, I mean, think about how Luke 15 starts. You know, he's, uh, Pharisees are grumbling because why? Anybody remember? Because he, he was, this man, he receives tax collectors, prostitutes, eats with them. And that's where he tells that story, the, that, that parable that's in three parts, you know, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and, and the prodigal son, or the two sons. And the older son, at the end of the parable, is doing what they're doing, isn't he? He's standing aloof, and he's saying, I will not go in and eat with that punk because he squandered my, he sinned. He's a sinner, and I'm not going to eat with him. I'm, I will not have anything to do with him because look what he did. He squandered your property, Father, with by riotous living. And what he's doing there is he's being, he, he is elevating himself above the Father. And it is, it is the most reprehensible part of the parable. It's worse than when the younger son was dining upon, was, was squandering the money. It's more offensive uh, than, than when, when he was living in riotous sin because he's doing it and claiming the name of the Father. Does that make sense? So self righteousness is. Something that is the, the legs are knocked out from under it again and again in the scriptures, um, and and rightly so, because that's the tendency of our flesh. You know, if Satan can't tempt us to sin blatantly, he will tempt us to say what? I thank you, God, that I am not like other men, right? Or even like this tax collector, right? 
But don't we celebrate the fact that we received the grace of God? That God had mercy on us. And should, shouldn't we celebrate that when it comes to others? They too can receive the grace. Isn't that the gospel? That, that David did this horrendous thing. And yes, there was a punishment. But he was still a man after God's own heart. There was still redemption. There was still forgiveness. And he was still an ancestor of Christ. So you can see right at the beginning, Matthew just goes straight for the jugular. Even in the genealogy, it's not boring at all. It's, it's rich with the gospel. With the gospel of uh, grace to the chief of sinners, as it were. So... This, this all has the background, and I'm going to probably end a few minutes early tonight. Uh, I started coughing like crazy about uh, 6.30, and, or about 6 o'clock tonight, and called Nicholas and asked him to, to pray for me, and he did. So uh, <clears throat> I'm not coughing right now, so that's awesome. But, uh, but all, this, all this has the background of Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who was called the Christ. And what was the problem? <clears throat> what was the problem with taking Mary as his wife? It wouldn't look very good, would it? Mm. She was already pregnant. She was already pregnant. Probably didn't look very good for David to take uh, Bathsheba as his wife either. So, so he's, 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 he's paved the way here. Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, to, of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Christ. And then so the, the genealogy is wrapped up, uh, as it were, and then you read about the birth of Christ in the first few verses. Uh, and the, uh, the angel, of course, you know, appears to him in a dream and says, Don't fear, don't fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And why was Jesus named Jesus? Anybody know? It says, for he will save his people from their sins. But what does that have to do? Adelon, what do you think? Yeah. It means the Lord saves, yeah. Job. So, was there any? Were there any Jesus in the Old Testament? Yeah. Who? Joshua. Boy, you're just on fire tonight. Huh? <laughs> That's right, Joshua. And what did Joshua do? If you could just wrap it up, just in a, in a snippet. Somebody besides besides my star pupil back here. Uh, what did Joshua do? Just the battle. Just the battle of Jericho. That's right. The walls came a ton. A ton they, of they conquered the land. They, they inhabited the land. They inhabited the promised land. Yes. Yeah. Joshua took them into the promised land, and the land had rest. And they rested. Is there any spiritual parallel to that that we can think about when, when it comes to Christ? Oh, yeah. yeah. He takes us from what? From the darkness of this world. From the the, the turmoil that we experience because of sin and, and rebellion to God, and He takes us ultimately into uh, the Jerusalem above. He makes us citizens of the Jerusalem above. He, he, he takes us into the real Promised Land. Um, he, he makes us, you know, He makes us citizens of the heavenly country. Um, you know, we read this this sort of thing in Hebrews where you know it says they they had you know here we have no lasting country, right? Um, you know they if they if they had uh, you know they would not have looked for a, for another day. Speaking of the true rest that is found in Jesus, um, and you know and there may also be another connection when it comes to uh, to this name, but uh, but but it's certainly uh, certainly on the uh, you know on the heels of of the Old Testament uh, Jesus or Joshua. He will save his people from their sins. So, so then the rest of the gospel, the rest of the gospels and the epistles answer this question, who are his people? Who are the people of Jesus? And, you know, we don't have time to go into that tonight, except to, except to say that uh, Father Abraham had many sons. Right? 
and I'm one of them, and so are you. What does that mean? <laughs> Those who are of faith are the children of Abraham. Jesus will say things like in John chapter. Do you have your hand up, Bill? Mm -hmm. No. Okay. Jesus will say things like in John chapter eight uh, to, to the Pharisees. They'll say, "We we are God's children. We're God's children." And Jesus will say, "No. If you were God's children, you would love me. If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. Uh, you are you are who, whose children? The devil's, the, the devil's children. So he re he really knocks the legs out from under." The, uh, the idea that literal descent from a patriarch or from a person means that you're God's children. John does that in the prologue of John. The children were born not of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. But the genealogy does this because if it was about natural descent, who else would be, uh, would be in line uh, for the promise? Well, Ishmael would be, Esau would be, any number of others would be. But it's by faith that the promise comes to fruition. Yes, sir. I was just going to say, and from the things that he said, several of the people that are in there wouldn't be included. That's right. That's right. Um, and so, so this question of, you know, my sheep hear my voice. I give them eternal life. Um, those who are called, not of the Jew, but also of the Gentile. Um, no one is a Jew who is one outwardly, but a Jew is one inwardly, right? This, this, all this is in kernel form, as it were, in the genealogy um, and in the gospel. Uh, Jesus saving his people from their sins. And what does he say in the Great Commission? Um, he says, he says, before he says, go into all the world. What's the, what's the slipping into some sermon material? What's the rationale? What's the basis for the Great Commission? Anybody know? Yeah. Yes, all authority is given to me in heaven and on earth, which, man, that's expansive authority. That means all the principalities, all the powers, all the angels, um, every, every being in heaven, the cherubim, the seraphim, the living creatures, everything is subservient to Jesus. Um, he has all authority in heaven and on earth. And this is speaking uh, particularly of the human nature of Jesus because the... The, the divine nature, you know, the, the deity of Christ is fully, you know, you know, always had all authority in heaven. But we're speaking of the, the, the whole Christ, the whole person of Christ uh, has all authority in heaven, and all authority in earth. And what does he say in John 17 uh, when it comes to this, when it comes to this authority? He says, uh, he, you know, Jesus lifted up his eyes to heaven and he said, anybody, anybody remember? Father, glorify. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. Since, anybody remember? Since you have given Him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given Him. This is what it means when it says that He will save His people from their sins. He will save the, 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 the Jew who has faith in Him. He will save the Gentile who is made a part of His people by faith. In his work, in him. Yes, sir. When I was a child, I remember um, the Presbyterian Church in Sunday school led us through a book, okay? Maybe some of you who grew up Presbyterians, remember a little book called A Promise to Keep? Mm -hmm. That rang a bell? Mm -hmm. I ran across one of those books and I got it. But, um, I mean, I never, it never clicked when I was a kid. But basically, it's the story of the Bible. And all these, these are all instances of faith and failure, mm -hmm. right? That you look at any person, faith and failure, you know, who's a, who's a believer. And um, so this book talks about the, uh, you know, sort of about the, um, the faithfulness of God furthering his promises of grace. And, and uh, it, of course, it builds and it builds through the covenant heads, you know, but finally, then you're going to get to the Great Commission. I'm going to miss that one. <laughs> but, uh, but God's still keeping his promise. Amen. He's still keeping his promise to, to bring... Grace to the nations. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why we're here. <laughs> that's why we're here. We, we are the nations. Yeah. Uh, so, so yes, and uh, so, so very good. So, uh, so that's that's the genealogy. And again, it's it's like two bookends on the on the Gospel of Matthew, as we'll see uh, this Sunday morning. Um, and uh, I praise the Lord for it. You know, when I when I read the genealogy, when I read any of the scriptures. See, like, 
like our brother saying you know there's faith and there's failure but it's about the one who is faithful and who promises and 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 these 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 people are are recorded uh and you know so that we won't lose hope so that we won't become discouraged so that we'll know that there is forgiveness and there is grace for us according to his promises all right any further questions comments all right let's pray father thank you for your word thank you lord that uh even even genealogies are so full of grace uh and so full of glory and so full of your love uh and your wisdom that we can marvel and worship you because of what you've done we thank you that you promised so long ago uh, to do what you what you did what you brought to fulfillment in the person and work of jesus christ in his ministry um, and lord we uh, we thank you that uh, we can relate we can relate uh, to these characters these people that live before us uh, that needed your grace just like we did uh, so help us lord to look to christ christ who will save his people from their sins christ who has saved us uh, christ who has begun a work in us and who will surely bring it to completion we ask it in jesus name amen mm -hmm.